A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. Good morning. It's so good to worship together today. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to begin to find Matthew chapter 4. We continue in our series this morning we've called Stirrings of a Kingdom. And as you find your way there, we've probably all experienced in our lives uh, what I would call maybe a wedge that can come in sometimes between relationships. And maybe you've seen it in family members where you know, you, you maybe it's your kids, you're trying to describe the way your family was, and, and as they get older, they begin to kind of notice, hey, I notice Aunt Ethel and Uncle Joe don't really talk to each other ever, right? And well, yeah, there was a feud that started years ago, and you begin to tell the story, somebody borrows somebody's lawnmower, and they didn't give it back, and, and since then, it's blown up, and then along the way, because of lack of communication or various different things, there's this wedge that has come between their relationship. And so we see it over and over and over again in real life. And some of us have even experienced that. Maybe it's with friendships or whatnot. And then there's such a release when finally that wedge is removed. And it's almost like this weight that sometimes you didn't even know was there is dropped when we reconcile and kind of live in a way with one another as Christ has really called us to. And then there's this weight, this freedom that comes from it. It's interesting because sin often causes these wedges. And we're going to watch this morning an attempt from the enemy to put a wedge between the Son and the Father. An attempt to separate that relationship in such a way that it would have amazing ramifications. And by the way, amazing not in a good way, but bad, we'll put it this way, ramifications. And it's the same thing that the enemy does in our lives. Because sin naturally begins to form that proverbial wedge in our relationship with the Father. And let me say this really, really clearly, so please hear this. If you are a Christ follower, if you have confessed Jesus as your Savior and Lord, there is absolutely nothing, as the Scripture says, that can ever separate you from the love of God. There is absolutely nothing that can make you old again once you've been made new. There's nothing that can make you unborn once you've been born again in Christ. So your salvation, your relationship is absolutely secure. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit who indwells us is the security of our salvation. Nothing can snatch us out of the hand of God. However, sin can disrupt that relationship. And so as we watch Jesus go through these temptations, as we watch him essentially do battle It is a great model for us in how do we fight against temptation and sin that affects our relationship with our Father. And here's the other thing to see, because so often in our culture we have this individualistic worldview where we just think really our choices are about us. Our sin not only affects our relationship with the Father, it affects every other relationship that we have. And so how do we do battle? Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, ending there in 11. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Father, would you speak to us through these words? Would you transform us to be more like your son today by the power of your spirit? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. So as we begin to understand then what's happening here, just a quick reminder, last week we saw this incredible moment where the Father and the Son and the Spirit all in one spot appear in those, uh, the, the, the Spirit in the form of a dove that comes down at the baptism of Jesus. The voice of the Father comes in and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so it is this declaration from everybody, including the Spirit, the Father, and now on the Son, that this is indeed the Messiah, the King, the One who has come. This is the Son of God with whom God is well pleased. And it goes right in that, from that incredible moment, into what we know as the temptation of Jesus. And so the transition there that Matthew gives us says, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So into the wilderness, what we probably understand, this is the Judean wilderness that's very close to where Jesus was at his baptism. It's a barren landscape. If we were to see it, uh, there's basically no trees, no vegetation, no food, no water. It is from the way down to Jerusalem and all around that area toward the Dead Sea. It is just a barren landscape. It's beautiful in its right, but it's barren. There's nothing there. And so this is the place uh, where Jesus is led. And it says in the scripture there, for 40 days... And for 40 nights he was fasting. And that's an important number because the scripture is giving us a hint right there. Oftentimes you will see in the scripture, and I mean very often, that 40 number that signifies testing and completion. Testing and completion. We see it in so many different lives, in so many different moments throughout the scriptures. Just to name a few, uh, Moses, his life was literally divided into 40s. So for the first 40 years of his life, he lived under, lived under Pharaoh's house and then had this moment where now he flees from that without going too far into the story. The next 40 years, he is a shepherd in the wilderness until the moment when God gets a hold of him at the burning bush and leads him back uh, to Egypt to free his people. And the last 40 years is what they wander in the desert after God has freed them through the, the wonders that he provides and before they go into the promised land, Moses dies. This, this time of testing, this time of completion. Not only that, we see it in even David, who was the great king of Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, of Israel, whose reign was 40 years. And then we see it in this wandering in the desert for 40 years of the Israelite people. And again, these are just a few of the moments, but this one's a really important one because what's interesting is what is happening in the story that Matthew is relaying to us about Jesus' temptation. That Jesus is literally taking on what is the understanding that he is the true Israel. Now let me explain that for just a minute. Israel was designed by God to fulfill a mission on this earth, to be the light to the other nations, to be faithful and obedient, to model what that looked like so that the world would see and know that there is a God and turn to Him. And over and over in their disobedience, Israel failed to do that. God was gracious time and time again, merciful time and time again, and yet over and over they failed to do that until God sends His Son, His only Son, who then would encounter what's amazing is the same temptations in the desert that the people of Israel encountered and yet Jesus overcomes whereas the people in the desert and Israel could not and so he becomes the faithful son the one that Israel was designed to be again showing this true kingship that he is the true Messiah that he is the one who has come the very son of God there's an interesting phrase though the very beginning of Chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, that says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Does that unsettle you a little bit? 
To think that the Spirit literally leads him into the wilderness. And there's some important points about it. If you have your notes, I encourage you to follow along. Because, but it's re- because this is really important for us to understand. How does God interact in terms of his leadership of us into a place where there is temptation? Or a place where there is testing? And by the way, you can use that word interchangeably. Some of your translations may even say testing at this point. Uh, but temptation and testing. Some words you can't use interchangeably. This is one that you can And so we see this is, yes, temptation, yes, testing, and that he's led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So we're going to get to that in just a moment. But one of the first things we have to see in that is this. To acknowledge that there is evil and an evil one. That there is an enemy. The Scripture multiple times calls him by different names here, whether it's tempter, devil, Satan, in Matthew 12, 24, it's Beelzebub, in Matthew 13, 19, just the evil one. But there is a reality that there is a spiritual battle that takes place. There is warfare that we cannot see that is going on all around us in a spiritual realm. And you know what's interesting is some of us in our minds are thinking, eh, because we have grown up in a world that basically has taught us over and over and over and over again this. If I can't see it, it's not real. If it's not right in front of me, empirically, empirically explained. If I can't get my mind around it, then it's not real and I don't believe in that. And, and by the way, that's recent in the scheme of world history. Only about the last 200 years has that even been a thing in culture that you would not acknowledge the existence of a spiritual world and the supernatural and the things you can't understand and can't control. And yet that in our day is the response often when we talk about evil or Satan. And so as believers, as those who understand the truth of Scripture, we have to come to a place where the very first thing we do is acknowledge that there is an enemy Because if we don't, there are ramifications for that. And so we acknowledge that there is an evil one because the response of our world, if I can call it this way, there's kind of three responses we're going to talk about to this, evil and temptation, all of that. The first is the ostrich response. And that's where most of our country sits. And you know what an ostrich does? Buries its head in the sand. Right? If I don't want to believe it, so I'm just going to bury my head in the sand and then all I can see around me is the dirt, the things I can feel. If it opens its eyes underground, I really don't know. But you get the picture. I'm just going to pretend the rest of it doesn't exist around me. And all those things that are unexplainable, we'll find some way to explain them or we'll just pretend they're not there. Right? So that's the ostrich. There's another response that's less, in our, less prevalent in our, our culture, but still exists out there. And this is the one I would classify as there's a demon behind every rock or every tree or anything that we encounter. Right? And so if you had to name this one, I call it, these are not scientific by any means, the fainting goat response. So you have the ostrich who buries his head in the sand. If you've ever seen a fainting goat, it, it, Google it. It's worth it, right? The fainting goat has this defense mechanism where when it gets scared, it literally, its body seizes up and it just falls over. Now, now why is that a defense mechanism? I don't know, right? Why is that helpful in the moment? But oftentimes, that's exactly our response when we live in such a way that if I didn't get that job, it was Satan. If something happened and my house flooded, it was Satan. If something happened and this took place in my life, it was Satan. And what it does is it paralyzes us like the fainting goat where we can't move forward in the way God's called us to because we're paralyzed from fear that he's around the next bend ready to take us out. None of those are healthy responses, the ostrich or the fainting goat. So how do we then understand what is a healthy response? So again, follow along in your notes. I want to give us three things. This is how we begin to respond in a healthy way. One, we've already mentioned to acknowledge the existence of the devil and evil and temptation. Now this is not the pitchfork red caped guy. But when we say the word devil or Satan, again, sometimes in your mind it just goes, oh, We have to acknowledge there's a reality there. That there is an enemy that is at work against us. And so we acknowledge that. The second thing that we acknowledge in a healthy response is this. We acknowledge the absolute sovereignty of God. And what I mean by that is this. This is not a dualistic response 
way of thinking of the world where you have Satan and you have God and they're fighting against one another and hopefully God ends up winning. No, no, no. God is absolutely sovereign, always has been from before time began, as we understand it, and will be for eternity forward. He is absolutely in control and he has allowed certain things to happen. We understand some of them, some of them we don't, but he is absolutely sovereign. As a matter of fact, because of what Jesus did on the cross, the battle, or excuse me, the war is over. Satan is a defeated enemy. Now, there are still battles that are raging because essentially, if you can think of it this way, he's clawing his way until Jesus comes back, trying to pull any with him that he can. So there is a reality of a battle, but the war is done. He is a defeated foe. But we see this, the reality of God's sovereignty, even in that phrase that Jesus was led up into the Spirit by the, or just led up by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So, so here's some important things to understand when we acknowledge that God is in absolute sovereignty of the world. One, regarding temptation, one is that God doesn't tempt. James 1.13 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So what it's saying is that God does not tempt us to walk into things hoping that we would sin. That's not part of his character. It's not part of his nature. Does he allow us to go there? Does he let us, lead us to places where we are tempted? Yes, we'll get to that in a moment. But he does not tempt us towards sin. The second thing is this. God allows us to be in those situations where we are tempted. Why? Why did God allow Jesus to go into a situation where he would be tempted and does the same for us, sometimes even leading us into that? Tempted, tested. I think there are two reasons, and they're very closely related. One is for our development, and two is for our preparation. Our development and our preparation. What do I mean by that? Well, we often talk about life in Christ, and you probably heard me use this illustration, that it's like a, a tree, right? And there's scripture, prayer, those disciplines that we have as we abide, those are the roots that grow deep. And then this trunk is what we call faith and obedience, this trust of God. And over time, as we trust him more and more, that tree grows, that trunk gets thicker and thicker. And these are moments as we walk into situations of temptation that we are developed in a way that we learn to trust God more and see his faithfulness and walk away stronger for it for the second part, which is the preparation for what he has next for us. Imagine what Jesus is about to go through and the temptations that he would face. And this is that moment of recognizing, is he ready for that? Fully God, fully man. And he comes out as he does, unscathed, without sin, of course. But there's a reality that God has great expectations for the life of Christ greater than we can imagine, right? We know the expectations greater than we can even understand in that. But here's the other thing for us to understand. God has incredible expectations and he's preparing you for what's next. And that's whether you're 8 or 80 years old. If you have breath in your lungs, God has a plan to use you. And so much of our story has been preparation for what he wants to use in us or for us to do next. And so God allows us to be in those situations. Here's the other promise of this, which is critically important. In every temptation, God provides a way out. In every temptation, he doesn't send us in alone, but equips us to be able to stand up underneath it. If you hear one passage when it comes to temptation this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, no temptation has seized you except for that which is common to man. And God is faithful that when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. For every single temptation, God is faithful that he will provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. So God doesn't send us in there alone. His presence is with us, guiding us, leading us in the midst of it so that we can walk out prepared. And that preparation aspect of it, I think about it in this way. It's almost like teaching your kids to drive. I haven't gone there yet, so pray for me. Josie's going to turn 14 soon, so we've got a little bit of time before the roads become more dangerous. But 
you remember if you raised your kids that way or if you've thought through how you're going to do this or you were probably raised in a certain way, the first time you start, essentially begin developing them, you don't necessarily throw the keys to them. You say, hey, I'm going to drive and you're going to sit there and we're going to talk about every decision I'm making, what I'm looking at, what I'm seeing, what this brake pedal does and why it's really important, right? What the gas does, your blinkers, all that. And you begin to explain everything. I can guarantee if they're over there on their phone, yeah, dad, Uh uh-huh. Right? You're going to be like, okay, you're not ready. We'll try again later. Right? And so finally, when they're paying attention, they're kind of talking back with you, all that. Then at some point, you say, I'm going to hand you the keys. You probably don't say, okay, now we're going to drive to Waco on I-35. No, we're just going to go around the block, take it slow and easy. And you see what I mean where there's a little bit more of trust and there's a little bit more of development and there's a little bit more, but you've equipped them and you're with them along the way until at some point you say, You're going to be tempted, if we can say it that way, to speed or to text and all that stuff, but at some point have to trust you're going to go out and drive the car and become a functioning human being behind the wheel. It's in the same way oftentimes. Now, the illustration certainly falls apart in certain ways. It's an illustration, but the reality is that God allows us to go into those things to develop us, to prepare us, and he is with us in every moment of it, providing a way out. And here's one more thing to throw in with that piece of temptation. We have no need to tempt ourselves to prove ourselves. What does that mean? It means if you struggle with sexual sin, then you need to guard yourself in every way around that. It doesn't mean that we just say, okay, I'm going to cavalierly walk into a situation that's going to put me in that. Let me give you another example. If you struggle with alcohol, if you are an alcoholic, the last thing you want to do is open a bar to minister to other alcoholics. It's true, right? But sometimes we think, you know what, I'm an overcomer, and so I'm going to put myself in situations and temptations, and that's just not wisdom. doesn't mean you can't minister to other alcoholics, but that setting's not the great place for it. So we don't lead ourselves into temptation. So then the third thing is this. We acknowledge the existence of evil, the devil, temptation. The third, second thing is we acknowledge that God is sovereign. The third is this. So how do we begin to fight this? We abide in Christ and suit up for battle. We abide in Christ and suit up for battle. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to fly through this, but I want to just touch on it uh, because it is the way that we begin to do battle in the spiritual realm. So here it is, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. In verse 14, stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth. One of the first things we see is the belt of truth that we would truly understand what is truth, God's word, and base our lives on that. It becomes our compass, our roadmap, all of it, that we understand that this is truth because what the world will tell you and it is often deceitful, And just twisted enough that it begins to walk us down a path that is not God's truth. That we would put on the belt of truth. It's critical. Because if truth has no objective standard, then truth just becomes what you define it. And if it becomes what you define it, then we're all in a scary place because truth is different for each one of us. And what right do you have to tell me what my truth is untrue? And me to tell you what your truth, when your truth is untrue. It's the way of our world. We have an objective standard of truth that God has revealed himself and given us truth. It is the very word of God. Take up, there, stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on then the breastplate of righteousness. So what does that mean? It means that we choose to live holy lives. It means that in the midst of this, That we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a holy life, but in that, that we have a choice in the midst of it. There's God's part and our part, if we can think of it that way. We have a choice then to say, I want to live a holy life to glorify God, empowered by His Spirit to do such. And so we choose to live holy as He is holy, as the Scripture tells us. 
the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes, verse 15, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, what does that mean? It means the shoes, the gospel of peace, that the way to walk in peace is through the gospel. And I would say it this way, that before we, uh, that the first thing we would do wearing the shoes, the readiness of the gospel of peace, is that every day we would preach the gospel to ourselves. And recognizing that we are free from sin and out of bondage only because of the righteousness and goodness of Jesus. And because his blood covers us as children of his, we now have the ability to live righteous and holy before God. And that we remember that this morning I wake up forgiven if I'm in him. If I've admitted that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and if I've believed that God sent his son Jesus to die for me, taking my sins upon himself on the cross to be raised from the dead, conquering death. And I confess him as Savior and Lord. And I have salvation. And when I have that salvation, I am made righteous and holy through the eyes of God because of the blood of Jesus that covers my sin. And when we start the day empowered in that way, then we can live having put on the breastplate of righteousness in holy lives with the belt of truth fastened around our waist because we know whose we are and where we're going. Not only that, then we begin to share the gospel with others, bringing freedom to others because the gospel of peace is our shoes. And it means we're walking to others saying, if you found freedom from the bondage of sin that you're in, even though you may not know it. And so we share the gospel, the good news of Christ It says then in verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. We talked about that shield uh, or the the tree trunk as it extends or grows, that, that faith and obedience, that the shield of our trust in God, the shield of our belief that he is who he says he is, when the enemy fires all kinds of darts at us, that that shield blocks those because we trust that God is absolutely sovereign and will protect us through it. The shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And then verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is that reminder that over our thoughts, over our head, that there's nothing that can separate us from God. Once we are in Him, we are His forever. And then verse 18, sorry, the end of 17, and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. And again, the sword, you get the imagery of the battle, the soldier that's going into battle, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that we've begun to hide God's Word in our heart. Psalm 119, 9 through 9 and 11, how can a young man keep his way pure? I've hidden God's Word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Right, and when temptation comes, you're quoting that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 verse, I know that no matter how much it tempts me, no temptation has seized me except for what is common to man, and God is faithful that when I am tempted, he will provide a way out so that I can stand up underneath it. Right? And we begin to use the scripture and wield that as a weapon against the schemes of the enemy when the fight comes. Because the word is the sword of the spirit. That last piece in verse 18 says, Then praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints If I can say it very simply, that we pray with alertness of the reality of the war that is going on around us. It's how we suit up for battle. So then let's look at the temptation that Jesus undergoes in the midst of this. Verse 2, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's probably an understatement. Right, 40 days and 40 nights without food, Jesus is hungry. And, and I want to make mention of this because it is the point, this first temptation we'll get to in just a minute, it is the very point at which the enemy attacks is at his point of hunger. And, and let me just briefly say this. Hunger, absolutely, he's talking about in the physical sense right there. He's literally hungry for food after fasting. But I think it's fair also to look at that and go, that is often the point the enemy attacks us is when we are hungry what I might call an unholy ambition. When I'm hungry to have my name known in my industry. When I'm hungry to have the most stuff that I can accumulate in my life. When I'm hungry for whatever relationship I think is going to fulfill me next. When I'm hungry for whatever images that I can see that will make me happy in the moment. When I'm hungry, so often is when the enemy strikes. 
And so there is a righteous and a holy ambition and hunger that is rooted in the things of God that, let's just say for your workplace, that I want to work in such a way that honors and glorifies God, that others would see me as I work diligently and I point them to him in the midst of that. That is a wonderful thing. But we have to be careful because our hunger can easily begin to make it about us. And so often that's when the enemy comes in and he just twists it enough. He just twists it enough. And we don't even realize it. It's at this point of hunger we see the first temptation. It says in verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man should not live by bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. This first temptation, when he attacks at that point where Jesus is most in need in hunger, he basically looks at him and says, hey, make these stones to bread and then you can have all that you want. You're hungry, right? Seems pretty simple. What's the big deal? Why can't he just do that? Jesus, fully God, can in that moment absolutely make those stones, perform the supernatural, become bread. Why is that such a big deal? What is the temptation? It is the temptation of provision. And let me put it this way. Food, among all other things of the good things that God provides, was never meant to satisfy. It was always meant to point us to the only one who can truly satisfy. Jesus, when he quotes, man shall not live by bread alone, is quoting a larger verse in Deuteronomy 8, 3, and it says this, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of of God. So what does that mean? It is the overcoming moment. Jesus, what they failed, the Israelites, remember we talked about this earlier, failed in the wilderness to see what manna was truly all about. Manna wasn't just about taking care of their physical need, but every morning when you go gather this manna, which the, was right there sitting on top of the stones, right? You go gather this manna and you bring it in. It was meant to remind you that everything comes from God, that your provision comes from God, that your sustainment comes from God. That your satisfaction is in Him, in His truth, in His Word, in His love, in His grace. And so often we confuse the gift as the place of our satisfaction. And hunger is the perfect illustration. Have you ever been satisfied after a meal? I mean, you're just sitting there. Maybe it's Thanksgiving. I always go there. And you're just sitting there going, man, I could not eat another bite. And that's at noon. And then five o'clock. Anybody up for a turkey sandwich? It's fleeting, right? Because food was never meant to satisfy. Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy. Now take that to every provision that God provides. Let's talk about relationships. In our culture, sexual intimacy and how the good things that God gives, our culture perverts, thinking that is what satisfies. And yet everything that God gives, every good and perfect gift is meant to point us back to him, to say he is the one who can satisfy. And when we find our fullness in him, then here's the amazing part, we can trust him for every provision that's needed. He knows what we need better than we do. And so in that moment, Jesus tempted to say, I'll provide for myself instead of looking to the one who provides what I'll need. I'll take for myself. I'll do what I want in the moment. I think about this again, using the food as an illustration. When Jesse and I um, got married, I fell in love, well, before we got married, but I was in love with her deeply, right? I also happened to fall in love with marble slab at that point. And I gained, I was about 30 pounds heavier than I am right now. It was, it was a... a a love relationship. And then literally I had to come to a point where I recognized I was looking for satisfaction in something other than Jesus. That hurts. Because a lot of us have struggled with that if we're not struggling with that now. It could be any number of things in our lives, right? Right? 
And so we recognize all of those things, the good and perfect gifts can be abused, but they're meant to point us back to Jesus. And Jesus overcomes in that moment. And so the question for us and the temptation is, do we trust God to provide what we need? And then when he does provide, do we continually to go back to the provider, not the provision? Second thing there, the next temptation that Jesus after provision, tempted in that way. It goes in verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so in this one, Satan takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, probably about 150 feet up in the air, and looks at him and says, now I'm going to quote scripture to you. And so he abuses and twists the scripture for his own purposes, and says, just throw yourself down, nobody can hurt you, right? God's promised that he's not going to hurt you, so why don't you just do this? And again, we kind of look at it and say, well, what's the big deal? Why is that a bad thing? He can just prove it right there, right? Right? And Jesus looks at him and says, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what is he saying? Because the temptation is this, control. Because here's what happens, and I think it's more familiar sometimes than we realize in our own relationship with God, is if Jesus were to do that, basically he's looking at the Father and saying, you have to save me. I'm going to throw myself off this. And you said you would. And so here you go. God, I want you to save me right now. And we manipulate the Father. And essentially, here's what happens. The servant becomes the master. Because we say, God, this is what I want. And you're going to do my bidding right now. And Jesus responds and says, no. It's not a battle for control. I'm content with God being in control. I'm content with God's plans. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6.16 again in the wilderness. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. It was a place where God provided water for them to drink. But here's what the people said as they were grumbling in that moment at Massah. It said, is the Lord among us or not? Essentially, they left Egypt and said, is the Lord among us or not? We need water. Is he going to do for us what we want or not? Are we going to be able to rub the God genie lamp so that he will pop out and give us what we need or not? As opposed to God, we absolutely trust who you are for your provision. And also we trust that you are in control. And it's your story, not ours. And how often in our own lives are we tempted with control and we just try to grab and say, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. Instead of recognizing that it's his story and he's gifted us and prepared us for the things he has called us to, not necessarily the things we want to do all the time. I think about it in, a, in kind of a silly way, but a real way. I ran cross country in high school and... Um, I never made varsity. So I was the guy who was kind of watching from the back as the good runners ran. And I remember so many times thinking, you know what, I'm just going to run harder. I'm going to do better. And I, and I was fighting against what I would call physiology, right? So I love running, and I know that's weird. Um, I just enjoy that. It's, it's one of those stress relief moments. But there's a pace I can get to, and I can go no further, right? That became abundantly clear to me one time when I was running uh, the, the Houston Marathon. And and as I'm getting, it's about mile 21, 22, and I'm feeling really good because I'd hit the wall at mile 22, if you know what I'm talking about as a runner, but there's only four miles left. And I felt great. It was a beautiful day and all that. And I'm running and I'm thinking, wow, this is really good. And then I get passed by a guy wearing a Statue of Liberty outfit. <laughs> and there's nothing more humbling than that because you've given it your all and I have given it everything I have. And this guy's literally holding up the torch running by me. And you realize, I will never be, I am not wired to be, I'm not made to be what some of those guys are capable of doing. Let's take that silly illustration in our lives. 
Sometimes we want to control so bad because we get our sights set on something that we were never intended to be or do. And we're fighting against God and what He's wired us to do because we've tried to make it about us and control the story. And God is absolutely in control. And Jesus in this moment says, I'm not going to test the Lord my God. He's in control to do what He wants to do. Then we get to the third temptation. This one becomes a lot more blatant. Jesus said, or I'm sorry, verse 8, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And so in this moment, there's kind of this visionary experience, if you can think of it that way, it takes him to a high mountain and all of the kingdoms of the world, and it says, and all their glory is shown to Jesus. And, and the first question that often comes into our mind is, does Satan even have this kind of authority that he can give this? Probably at this point, because he's the prince of the power of the air, the prince over the earth at this point. Does he even have that authority? Maybe so. The point is, is that he's offering this to Jesus. And get the picture of this. Jesus knows what is ahead of him. He knows the difficulty that will come. He knows the rejection he will face. He knows the wrath of God that he will endure on that cross and all of our sins. And in this moment, Satan's looking at him and saying, you can have all of this. It's the shortcut. That's what everyone's expecting anyway, right? They want the Messiah who can reign over all these kingdoms. You can have it all. I'll give it to you. All you have to do is bow down. And you can forgo all the hardship, all the difficulty, and you can have it now. It's the temptation of power and idolatry. Just take it. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. And Jesus vehemently responds in this one. We get the exclamation point. Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Quoted from Deuteronomy 6, 13, and 14. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples that are around you. And the question for us is this. Is your life lived to the glory of God? Or is it for your advancement? And the following question, do we recognize that power and influence is God's? And any that we have, we are stewards of. It's not ours. We are stewards of any influence, of any gifting, of any ability to use for His glory. And Jesus in this moment said, you shall worship the Lord your God alone. Not power, not any idol that would come in the way. Not making ourselves idolatry, not the idolatry of our age, which is stuff, which is success, which is well, you name it. We'll worship the Lord your God alone. And by the way, the means matter, not just the end. There are no shortcuts. It's trusting God in every step of the journey. When it feels good and will it, when it doesn't. When we learn to abide in that way, there's this passage in John 10 that says this. This devil or the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy and then Jesus says but I came that you may have life and have it abundantly and when we begin to walk in him abide in him acknowledging that God is sovereign acknowledging that there is a spiritual battle at place and when we suit up with the armor of God and begin to walk with him we understand our identity remember those temptations that Satan give if you are the son of God if you are the son of God just bow down and worship me no no he is the Son of God, and we are the sons and daughters, little sons, little daughters of God, adopted by His. We have an identity that is in Him, and we know for sure as we abide in Him, we find life abundant. Instead of giving into sin that steals, kills, and destroys. 
and that we can overcome through Christ's temptation. What I love about all this, this passage of scripture, two out of Deuteronomy 6, that Jesus quotes, one out of Deuteronomy 8, it begins in Deuteronomy 6, 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And here's what he commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. When we start there and we abide, we suit up for battle, that any temptation that comes against us, we can win the battle against. As a matter of fact, James says this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right after that, it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Would you bow your heads with me? Just encourage you with your head bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're battling some kind of temptation in your life. And you just need to confess before God. You've been relying on your own strength. Or you've just been given in. And you just need to ask Him for strength and begin to suit up abiding in Him. Would you just confess that to Him? And maybe today you realize your identity is not secure in Him and that you've never confessed Jesus as your Savior and Lord can do that today. In just a moment, our prayer partners, our staff will be down front. We would love the opportunity to pray with you. It could be about anything that's going on in your life. It could be about the recognition that you need to find Christ, to be found in Him. He's right there calling. You need to put your faith and trust in Him and find new life today. It could be just something that's stressing you out, something that you're walking through that's been difficult. We would love the opportunity to pray with you about whatever it might be. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the power of your word, the power of your truth, and God, how Jesus endured. And so, God, we are so grateful that we have a Savior who can identify with us and understands temptation, and yet he walked through it unscathed and sin-free, as the scripture says. And so, Father, because he accomplished that, we know in him, God, we can walk out of temptation and find victory. And God, we know that when we fall, we can get back up, confess our sin, and walk with you in faithfulness, because your grace and your mercy cover us in Jesus. And so, Father, would we be faithful to do that today? And we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.